Welcome everybody to this um, tutorial on spin orbit coupling and other relativistic effects. And what I want to show you today is um, how to include these effects in your DFD calculations and uh, also discuss when this is actually necessary. So you might find out that already to explain the difference in color between silver and gold, it is necessary to um, include scalar relativistic effects in your Hamiltonian. And if you want to describe, for example, edge currents uh, in a topological insulator, or explain why the compass needle rotates in the Earth's magnetic field, then um, you need to include spin orbit coupling effects. And, um, and this will um, be the topic of uh, this little uh, lecture here. So first we will start with the basics. We'll be, have a look at the Dirac equation and uh, the Pauli equation um, that derived from it and the spin orbit coupling included there. And then we will have a look at non-magnetic systems like um, <coughs> see, like uh, Rashford and Dresselhaus effect, the topological insulators, and finally we will focus on magnetic systems and have a look at Charshinsky Maria interaction and magnetic anisotropy um, <coughs> as spin orbit coupling effects appearing there. Now, let's start with the Dirac equation, which uh, you can find here. It includes a scalar and the vector potential in the Hamiltonian. And this Hamiltonian acts now on a four component wave function. You have a large and a small component, and the large and the small component, they have spin up and spin down parts, um, respectively. And um, you can write the Dirac equation now as coupled equations for um, large and small components. And if you perform the non relativistic limit, then you will recover the normal Schrödinger equation. So if um, all potential energies here are much smaller than the rest mass, <coughs> then you get the Schrödinger equation with this um, minimal extension of the uh, momentum by the vector potential here, which we usually ignore in, in the calculations. And then we have the normal Schrödinger equation, but it acts now on the large component, which has a spin up and a spin down part, as you can see here. Um, if you want to get in more relativistic effects, then you can keep terms up to the order of 1 over c square, and you will find um, four additional terms. And this equation here is then called the Pauli equation. And you have a so called mass velocity term here additionally, you have the Darwin term, and then the spin orbit coupling term, uh, which will be our main interest, and you have the coupling um, of the spin here to um, a magnetic field. And uh, <coughs> it is possible to um, directly integrate these additional terms into your DFD Hamiltonian. You have to make a little approximation here for the uh, mass velocity term, but otherwise this is very simple. And if you neglect the spin orbit coupling, and if you say the magnetic field is just pointing in that direction, then you arrive <coughs> at a very simple Hamiltonian, which has a spin up and spin down part of the wave functions actually decoupled here. And this is uh, this scalar relativistic um, Hamiltonian that is included in our calculations in the muffin tins around in the atoms. Now, to show you a little bit what is the influence of this um, different approximations, I compare here in a calculation the density of states of silver and gold in a non-relativistic fashion, in a fashion that includes scalar relativistic terms, and uh, including scalar relativistic and spin orbit coupling terms. And you can see that in the non relativistic um, calculations, the D band of silver here uh, sits very deep. Here is the S band, this is the D band, but also in gold, um, all the D states are below 3 EV. Now, if you include scalar relativistic calculations, then you see that um, 
the gold D band shifts up more than the silver D band and gets additionally broadened. And the uh, spinopic coupling then just uh, adds a little bit more fine structure to the density of states of the D electrons, as you can see here. And uh, this shifting up in the scalar relativistic calculations here accounts for this difference in color between silver and gold, as uh, you know it from um, normal quants. Now, let me look uh, again to the spin orbit coupling term that we just uh, quickly mentioned before. Um, we have it written in, in this way, and you can see this is the coupling of a spin. This is uh, the vector of the Pauli matrices here to a magnetic field, which uh, is now an internal magnetic field, which comes from the electric field, that means from the uh, gradients of all potentials that we have in our solid. And uh, when an electron moves through this electric field now with uh, some momentum p, then it sees this as um, a b field, Lorentz transformed, and this b field couples then to the spin of the electrons. So we can write it as um, a sigma dot p term, um, like the interaction with the external magnetic field, and we have in addition this Thomas factor of uh, one half appearing here. Now for very simple situations like uh, central potential in an atom, um, <coughs> one can rewrite this spin orbit coupling uh, term so that uh, it includes just now the radial derivative of the potential and uh, some prefactors, and this is then a spin orbit coupling constant xi here. And uh, what remains is um, and the top product between the vector of Pauli matrices and R cross P, which is nothing else than the orbital momentum, and therefore um, this operator is called a spin orbit coupling term. You can also derive um, from this form here that uh, the um, spin moment and the orbital momentum they actually couple anti parallel, and uh, this is also known as Surt's Holmes rule. Now, um, after this introduction in the theory, let me come to manifestations of um, spin orbit coupling in, for instance, in non magnetic solids. And uh, for this here, I show you a simple uh, example a semiconductor germanium calculated without spin orbit coupling and with spin orbit coupling. And you can specify this in the input file by setting this. Uh, flag uh, sock here um, to true. And then you get two band structures which are not so different at first glance, but if you look, for example, closely here at uh, the gamma point, and I magnify this here for a moment, and then <coughs> you will find that this original triply degenerate state here now splits into a twofold and a single degenerate state, just um, like. Uh, the p electrons uh, split into p1 half and p3 half states. And this splitting is actually very important now for transport in semiconductors because now um, this is this uh, different bands and that contribute differently to the conduction. And they all got separate names that I mentioned here. And you can even see a splitting along certain um, isometrical lines here. This um, um, uh, gamma L here is then called the Dresselhaus splitting and that um, occurs in uh, germanium which has a diamond structure and uh, this symmetry is quite high and only along certain lines you can observe some additional splitting um, due to this Dresselhaus effect. Now uh, this germanium has inversion symmetry but in systems without inversion symmetry we can uh, observe even stronger spin orbit coupling effects, and one of them is the so called Rushbar effect. And uh, it's a very prominent effect on every surface because on the surface you have, of course, always a broken inversion symmetry, and this leads to an electric field which points perpendicular to the surface. And um, now an electron that moves in this electric field with a certain momentum p here sees then this um, electric field as a magnetic field, 
And um, in a non-magnetic system where we have um, half of the electrons spin up and the other half spin down, let's say, now uh, they can orient um, either parallel or anti-parallel to this uh, B field here and thereby gain or lose um, energy. And uh, this um, effect can be uh, easily described by this model Hamiltonian here, but um, also you get it from your DFD calculations when you switch spin orbit coupling on. And you can observe the splitting also experimentally on surfaces if you have surface states that live here. And the well known example are coinage metals like copper, silver, and gold, which have surface states that are visualized here by this SDM in the Corral um, and by the IBM group. And uh, if you look carefully um, with uh, angular resolved photoelectron spectroscopy, then you see the surface state here in silver with, with uh, almost no splitting, but uh, in gold you see a prominent splitting and uh, also in your DFD calculation if you switch on the spin orbit coupling you can see this splitting in the red and blue here just uh, um, signifies um, the two different spin directions and agreement with experiment is actually um, very fine in this case. Um, now this was a case where you had a surface state that was then modified but there are also cases where um, surface states appear only due to spin orbit coupling. So without spin orbit coupling you have here in this antimony telluride you can see here um, you have a band gap and uh, with spin orbit coupling suddenly states appear and this is um, in the hallmark of a topological insulator and this antimony telluride is one example of that. Of course we also have normal surface states like this one here, and uh, they get split then um, due to the Rushball effect that we just discussed. But um, these other states that appear here, they come due to a band inversion that is called, uh, caused by the spin orbit coupling. And uh, you can um, also calculate this band inversion in your DFD calculation. And uh, I've chosen here a different example, bismuth and antimony, because they also have a very uh, similar band structure. And um, they have um, this, they are semi metals with a small band gap here at the L point. And now, if you uh, calculate uh, these states here at the L point, and if you play with the spin orbit coupling strengths just a little bit, then you see that uh, one of the states goes down, <coughs> whereas the other goes relatively up. And um, once this uh, band inversion happens, you have actually a transition from a trivial to a non-trivial semi-metal. <coughs> and here it's uh, the antimony that is the non-trivial semi-metal. Um, if um, you look then at the surface states, yeah, you can um, make this simulation that I show you here also with uh, a switch a SOX scale that you can find in the input file which allows you to turn on and off um, uh, the strengths of the spin orbit coupling matrix elements. Now if you look at uh, in the surface states that result from uh, these two cases with and without band inversion then we will find um, that in bismuth, the surface states there again uh, spin orbit split in different spin channels. Um, and then these post spin channels return um, from the valence band to the valence band, so that uh, we have in total um, <coughs> a band gap everywhere. Whereas in the case of antimony, they actually connect uh, valence and conduction bands, which makes the antimony. Uh, topological semi-metal. Now these were examples of non-magnetic systems. Let me finally in the last five minutes or so discuss spin orbit effects in magnetic systems where they are also very important and there uh, are uh, examples will probably come in the afternoon from um, this class of materials. Now <coughs> in magnetic systems 
we usually want to describe magnetic interactions and uh, interactions between two spins you can generally write now as a, a product between um, a spin and matrix and the second spin here and um, <coughs> when they are either located on two different or on the same side and for the on-site terms you can distinguish between the scalar part of the interaction which is uh, just uh, the stoner magnetism and a traceless symmetric part <coughs> which is the magnetic anisotropy which determines in the end in which direction uh, your spin uh, wants to point here in this particular side and if um, <coughs> i and j are on different sides then again you have a scalar part which is the heisenberg type interaction which just determines whether the two spins on the two sides are either parallel or anti-parallel like this here um, and then you have a traceless symmetric part which um, is a kind of dipolar interaction that is described here and you have an anti-symmetric part which is the so-called jarzinski maria interaction which uh, we will discuss a little bit more in detail and uh, now um, on the scalar parts of the interactions on the stoner and the heisenberg um, part and they are already included on a non-relativistic level so there you can <coughs> say whether um, a particular compound is now magnetic or not or the two spins couple parallel or anti-parallel but all the other interactions which determine the easy axis where the magnetization wants to point to uh, more, uh, more complicated spin structures they arise due to spin orbit coupling effects and you have to include them explicitly so <coughs> for example this jaroshinsky maria interaction here <coughs> comes from the anti-symmetric part of this exchange matrix <laughs> and uh, you can rewrite this and the kind of form of this triple product which contains here the cross product between the two spins at side i and side j and um, <coughs> this d here gives so to say the interaction strengths and um, now uh, the effect that you get uh, from this interaction is that it actually distinguishes if um, you have two spins um, want to tilt a little bit um, away from each other or towards each other <coughs> and uh, because this is what is described by this cross product here and this defines then a certain kind of chirality um, <coughs> of a spin structure and this is something that leads for example to the formation of skirmions if uh, the symmetric conditions for this Jaroszynski maria interaction if they are given the normal Heisenberg type interaction this doesn't distinguish between a spin structure that rotates clockwise or counterclockwise um, and there you cannot get something like this um, another uh, spin orbit coupling effect is the magnetic anisotropy and uh, this we will also uh, calculate in um, with the fluid code for <coughs> a certain system so if you um, have a magnetic material like nickel or iron and then without spin orbit coupling you can say what is the magnetic moment <coughs> um, whether this thing is magnetic or not but whether the magnetic moment wants to point now in zero zero one direction or in a one 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 direction this uh, you cannot say but uh, in reality of course you know that uh, there is a clear magnetization direction dependence even in a cubic crystal like in nickel or iron and uh, there are certain constants which you can um, then define which um, describe the magnetic anisotropy of your system and uh, the sources for this magnetic anisotropy they are of course um, on one side this um, kind of dipolar interaction so if you rotate to power magnets around each other of course uh, you will um, see the difference whether they point um, as I was saying in the same direction like this here or whether they um, parallel to each other 
which uh, has higher energy. Um, but uh, in this dipolar interaction is something that is not included in the DFD calculations but can be included on classical level. But uh, spin orbit coupling gives you another source of magnetic anisotropy, and this is actually included in your calculation. And uh, you can see where this uh, energy comes from if uh, you look at the energy in second order perturbation theory um, that comes from spin orbit coupling. And uh, this spin orbit coupling uh, Hamiltonian then couples. Uh, these two wave functions, i and j, um, depending on their symmetry and depending on the direction of the magnetic moment. So <coughs> you can write these matrix elements in, um, in this way. You have the L to the S, the, um, the form that we had earlier for the spin orbit coupling Hamiltonian here. And uh, now um, you can derive uh, for let's say for d uh, orbitals, which um, orbitals can be coupled by spin orbit coupling for um, certain directions of the magnetization. So <clears throat> if you have, for example, an xy orbital, you can couple to an x square minus y square orbital if the magnetization uh, points in that direction. And this gives you the uh, <clears throat> direction dependence um, of the total energy. And the same is um, true for the uh, orbital moment. Also, the orbital moment depends on the um, direction of the magnetization. It can also be obtained in second order perturbation theory in a very similar form, as uh, you can see here. And uh, large uh, changes in the orbital moment are then also associated with large changes in the total energy. And uh, as I, I told you, it depends um, on the orbital symmetry that is involved, whether you get a large orbital moment and whether you get a large magnetic anisotropy. So <clears throat> just as a simple example, I show you here a molecular magnet, um, which consists of two europium ions, um, which are sandwiched in between these uh, planar organic molecules here. And uh, now we can do two calculations. Once the spins uh, lie perpendicular to the connection axis between um, these magnetic atoms here, or they lie in the axis of the molecular magnet here. And uh, you can specify the direction of the magnetization in the input file. and uh, by specifying the azimuthal and the polar angle, you switch spin orbit coupling to true. And then you will see in these two cases you get uh, different um, energy spectra if the magnetization is in a radial direction. And then we have a WG degenerate state here um, at the Fermi level. But if it is um, parallel to the molecular axis, and then we see this. Um, level here split and we actually get then a large orbital moment in that case and we get the highly preferred um, magnetic states with, with this configuration. And um, in um, a solid of course we have uh, many states uh, in the full band structure and they in total result um, in them um, in a certain magnetocrystalline anisotropy that we can determine. So let me summarize here um, the most important points that I wanted to show you. We have um, started with uh, the Dirac equation and uh, arrived from the both scalar relativistic effects that we have seen in the deep end position of gold and silver and spin orbit coupling effects. And uh, there we looked at uh, non magnetic time reversal. Uh, symmetric systems and we have seen um, these uh, splitting of states in the germanium in the case with inversion symmetry and without inversion symmetry we have seen this example of the Rushper effect and uh, in magnetic systems so without time reversal symmetry um, we have seen that we get the magnetocrystalline anisotropy 
and uh, if inversion symmetry is missing, then we also get this Jarzinski Maria interaction. And um, <clears throat> I hope that uh, you now um, are in the position to know when to switch on the spin orbit coupling um, and how to do this. Uh, we will learn in the afternoon. Thank you for your attention.